I'm going to return um, to the QR code that we launched about at the beginning of the year. January, there was QR codes in front of your chairs. There was green cards. What may we pray for you for? And out of that, uh, the top priority was children. And we talked about that with King Josiah being an influence and, uh, and just investing in our children and we may be raising that next generation of Josiah's or Billy Graham's or whatever it may be. Uh, and I want to return to that because the next topic that was uh, right behind the children was marriage. And so I had a sermon that was planned, um, and I uh, pushed that one out because I felt if I want to talk about marriage and communication, right? Because marriage deals with relationship, it deals with finances, it deals with sex, it deals with uh, communication, it deals with a whole bunch of things. But in order for me to actually talk about that, I can't assume that everybody here knows what the Bible says about marriage. And so I, bet, I, I, I pushed that one off to the side and recalibrated this one of honoring marriage, laying the foundation. Because the Bible has a lot to say about marriage. We have a whole entire book, the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, written about marriage. It's about dating. It's about courting. It's about engagement. It's about marriage. It's about sexual intimacy. It's about fighting. And it's about ending well. And we did a deep dive study of that last year. You can go on our podcast handle and listen to the deep dive study of us talking about the Song of Songs. But it's not just in marriage and relationship because this also deals with laying the foundation. If you are in a relationship, boyfriend and girlfriend, dating, courting, engaging, whatever it may be, uh, married, or you don't have your spouse uh, anymore, um, laying the foundation of communication teaches us to always be good communicators. That's the whole point of it. So we're going to take a look at Ephesians chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, please turn there. If you have one of our free Bibles that you can take with you, it's page 784. And before we get into Ephesians 5, which is going to be talking about wives and then husbands, I'm going to back up and talk about the church first. Because Paul lays the foundation in the church. He talks to everybody. That's where we're going to start. But up until this point, Paul has written the church in Ephesus, and he's talking about their adoption. They're in the family of God, not because of their works, but because of what Christ has done. He talks about that you're saved by grace and by faith alone. You can't even brag about it because you did nothing to deserve it. Then he talks about his apostolic ministry, what he's been entrusted to, to the Gentiles. Then he talks about church, church unity and church discipleship. And that's what we get about chapter 5, to be imitators of God. So before he even talks about marriage, wives, and husbands, he starts with the imitation factor. Imitating. What are you imitating? So if you found your way to Ephesians 5, before we jump into uh, the text that I would like to talk about, about wives, and we'll talk about husbands next week, um, and then we'll talk about communication after that, let's take a look how Paul sets up the what's known as the marriage uh, part of Scripture. You also find this in Colossians 3, and 1 Peter talks about this as well. But I want to back up. So let's pick up at verse 15. He says, So then, church, be careful how you walk, not as wise, or not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. I want to kind of camp out here a little bit. Notice what he says, be careful how you walk. Be careful how you walk. Uh, this idiom in Scripture is all about who are you patterning after? Who are you walking after? Who are you mimicking? Who are you following? Because we have Jesus is our example, and Jesus tells us to pick up his cross and follow him. Jesus tells us the book of 1 John is all about what are you practicing, 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 practicing. What are you practicing? Because if you're practicing evil and wickedness and sexual immorality, you are going to reap what you sow. And it's not going to be very good. And John, in the book of 1 John, says, stop practicing this. As a matter of fact, start practicing what is biblical, what is honorable. Start practicing righteousness. And it is hard. But whenever you practice something, whether it's a musical instrument, piano, guitar, sports, you're practicing because you want to become perfect in it. You're practicing because you want to become an expert in it. So John takes that daily application. He says, what about the spiritual realm? What are you practicing? Be careful how you walk. Be careful who you're following. As a matter of fact, be careful of who you're allowing to pour into your life, which we spoke about last week. The charge is to be aware. Be attentive. What are you allowing? Who are you allowing to influence you? Because they will dictate the direction on where you are going. None of us are exempt from that. We are always being influenced by who or what, but we're always an influence to somebody else as well. Do you want them to replicate that? 
do you want them to replicate what we are doing? Paul is saying, look at church. Be careful, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of your time. Learn to maximize. Maximize your time here on earth because you're here and gone. Whether you pass away from old age and Jesus comes to take you home personally, praise God. Or Jesus says, the time is now, church, and we're all raptured, praise God. But until then, we're living between the dash, the time that you were born and the time that you die. We're living in the dash right now. How are you maximizing that time? How are you living that time? Because the days are drawing to an evil close. Paul, when you wrote this 2,000 years ago, were you thinking about us in 2024? Because, man, things are getting crazy. It's like, I just want to get popcorn and just watch the social media feed. I'm like, what's going to take place next week? This is like, everything is changing so fast, but you can't get distracted by that. He says, be careful how you walk. Maximize your time because the days are evil. We do not know how much time we have on this earth. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand the, what the will of the Lord is. Do not be foolish. In the Hebrew thought, wisdom is not your acclamation of knowledge. And Jesus taught this when he encountered the Pharisees. It's not the accumulation of knowledge. Because the Pharisees would have had the first five books of Moses memorized verbatim in the Hebrew by heart. Some of them would have memorized the Psalms and the wisdom literature. Many of them probably would have gone on to memorize the whole Tanakh, Torah, Nevaim, Ketubim, the whole Old Testament. They would have had it memorized. They were far from God. It's not the accumulation of knowledge that makes you wise. It's the application of what you do know that makes you wise. In the Hebrew thought, if you absorb scripture and you refuse, not that you struggle with the application, but you just refuse to allow scripture to transform your heart and to say, man, this is sinful. I got to cut that out. I got to start doing what is biblical. You refuse to do that. You're a fool because you know what is right. And yet you harden your heart toward the movement of the Holy Spirit and you refuse the application. So when the Bible talks about us being fools, it's not that we're just ignorant upon a subject, because all of us are ignorant upon a subject. I'm not a heart surgeon. You ask me about heart surgery, and you want me to do that on you, I'll kill you. I mean, I can guarantee you, you're not going to last very long. That's not, my, that's not my area. So I'm ignorant on that. But when we are ignorant upon Scripture and the Holy Spirit reveals to us through study, through being in the Word of God, through prayer, through groups, through church fellowship, now what are you doing with that knowledge? If you're feeling convicted, like, man, i got to get some things right in my life. Okay, that's awesome. At least you're aware. First step is awareness. How are you going to apply that? It's when we don't apply it that our hearts become harder and harder and harder toward God's conviction. Paul says, look at church. You're born-again believers in Ephesus. He's writing to the church. Don't be fools but understand what the will of the Lord is. Look, if we are searching for the will of God, that means we are intentionally practicing. Please remember that word. If you walk out of here today, just, I don't know. He spoke about practicing. Practicing searching for the will of God. I got to wake up every day. Uh, hopefully, I'll get into my Bible. If you don't have a physical Bible, take one of these home. Uh, you don't have to rip out a little scripture verse. Just take the whole thing home. Take it home. Uh, that's why we have them. We'll order more. We want you to have a Bible in your hand. There's so many apps on the phone you can download. We find the will of the Lord in Scripture, spending time with Him, just saying, Lord, where, where am I at with you on this? We find it through worship music. If their lyrics are biblical and they're encouraging you and they're stirring you up, you're like, man, Lord, you are the mover of mountains. Lord, you are not restricted. The same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead is living within me. Lord, thank you for that reminder. Thank you that you're great. Thank you that you surpass my insecurities. Thank you that you're not restricted to my shallow thinking or my shallow understanding. Lord, what's your will for me in this area? We got to turn to Scripture because that's what Timothy is told when we turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you look at 2 Timothy 3.16, it's page 800 in our Bibles here. Notice what it says here. All scripture is inspired. Is that the Quran? Is that the Tao Te Ching? Is that, uh, is that the Book of Mormon? Is that any extra biblical books out there, the Apocrypha? No, no, no. 
Scripture is what you have in your hand. Paul would have been writing, referencing the Old Testament. The New Testament's not even written, but 1 Peter 3.16 talks about Paul's letters are equal to Scripture. So we know the whole New Testament canon is inspired as the early church was following the apostolic teaching of the early church. In Acts, it says they follow the teachings of the apostles. All Scripture is inspired. God breathed. And also what it says, look at beneficial for teaching. I like that. For rebuke. I don't like that. For correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. How do we understand the will of God? You go to Scripture. Lord, I have an opportunity here uh, that's before me. I have a job. I have a relationship where I got to clarify my relationship with you, Lord, or clarify my relationship with the person that I'm dating or whatever it is. Lord, I want to just get my life right with you. I got to be able to go to Scripture so that I can discern the will of God. The Lord will not reveal to you through some prophetic utterance, through some mystical teaching that contradicts the Bible. If you ever succumb to or listen to somebody that says, yeah, they're full of errors and stuff like that, I got the new teaching. It's actually in this special book, only in this special book. Or come and listen to our latest prophet. Come and listen to whatever. And if they're contradicting Scripture, that's called a cult is what that's called. But if you're not in the Word of God, how do you know you're in a cult? We're just being swept away because a person speaks really eloquently. We're like, wow, that person has really good, speaks better than my pastor. There's a lot of great uh, preachers out there, a lot of great teachers. And I can tell you this, they're leading you, or they're leading many people astray. Hopefully not you, but they're leading people astray. Because they take scripture, they manipulate it, but your Bibles are never open. And so people are just sitting there like, yeah, I guess that's true. He quoted something. Man, get your Bibles open on your phone in a physical thing. Paul says that's where the inspiration is. It's God breathed. He used men in their time, in their situation to pin scripture. And now that we read scripture, what are you doing with it? Are we applying it? Are we trying to figure out like, wow, I understand the head knowledge. I totally get that, but I struggle in application. Well, hey, welcome to the club. It's, it's, we're, we're, we're walking this together. So how do we begin understanding? We go to scripture first. Secondly, we read additional books. There's a lot of great authors out there. I'm not against books. I love education. I love to learn. It's seeking um, somebody to come alongside you and walk with you through counsel. Look, at when I was younger, I really didn't care for marriage counseling. I thought that was for weak people, and I, have, I held that ground. I was like, we don't need marriage counseling. No, nah, we just got the Bible. Why? It, duh. It's inspired. It's scripture. And when my wife and I hit a hard time, and don't worry, I got permission from my wife to share this. Uh, when we were in my undergraduate, I was going to school, was working full-time and going to school full-time and leading Bible studies. We were juggling kids in the 20s. It was just a blur of just kids and working and trying to just figure out life. You're just trying to figure out, like, where do we go from here? Um, our marriage was getting fractured because there was a lot of things pulling us in different directions. Um, and I think and my wife remembered uh, or recommended, hey, I think we need like a weekend to remember or some like counsel. Like, no, we don't. All we need is scripture. Are you reading your Bible? Because I'm reading my Bible arrogant posture. I had an arrogant posture. I was like, because I'm studying it. I'm just like, no, we're reading it. This is inspired. All we need is just the Bible. And then we went through a season of, I didn't honor that. So uh, I didn't honor her request for counsel or weekend to remember. Fast forward from taking 10, 11 years to get my bachelor degree. We went down to New Orleans for my graduate. And then again, the pressure got hotter. It just intensified. It's like, you know what? I think we need some counseling. No, we don't. I'm studying it. Are you studying it? And then you know what? As arrogant and as just closed-minded or myopic of how I was, um, it wasn't the struggle of comprehension, reading comprehension. We can put words together to make sentences and read it. it we, we, we could memorize Scripture. What I began to realize, even though I was a student of Scripture, is that we were struggling to apply what the Bible was teaching. Application. And so I said, no, we don't need counseling. So... It wasn't until the last semester that I said, you know what? I think we need counseling. Because <laughs> um, we were talking about the same argument over and over and over again. I'm just like, what is going on here? Why are you not understanding me? And so I contacted the seminary, and the seminary provide a marriage counselor for it. And it was the best investment I ever did. So he asked me now on this side, what do you think about marriage counseling? I said, you better get into marriage counseling. Because counseling to me, was a pivotal part in our marriage that, to me, kept us together. 
because there's a lot of triggers and arguments of finances and intimacy and all this stuff that you want to fight or flight. And most people want to flight. They just want to bolt with that. But we need scripture. We need somebody to walk with us. Help us to understand the will of God in my marriage, in my kids, when they're rebelling, with my, with, with my in-laws. Oh, Lord Almighty, that's a sermon for another time. In-laws. Or if you are an in-law and you're living, Lord, how, what is your will for this? I need somebody that has walked this path, that has the tools, that can say, hey, have you thought about this? In our, in our, in our actual marriage counseling, I was like, well, what's going on? Well, I'm saying this, and Rachel is saying this. She goes, so we're like this all the time. Like, we've talked about this like thousands of times. Why are we talking about this again? Because you're not coming online together. You're using different terminology and wanting to win the argument. She's using different terminology, wanting you to understand. And the counselor was able to bridge the gap to bring us together to where we both were like, oh, we're saying the same thing. She's like, yeah, you are. How come we didn't discover this earlier? Because none of you are slowing down to understand the other person. What happens is usually in a time of communication, we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks in marriage, is that we want to win the argument. You don't want to win the relationship. Somebody wants to walk away a victor, which means somebody's going to walk away a loser. And that's not the goal of marriage. That's not the goal of relationship. That's not the goal of the church. We haven't even got to wives yet. He's still talking to the church. Understand what the will of God is. Search for him. Search for him. Be in scripture. And he goes on. Let's, don't get drunk with wine in which there is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit. Uh, speaking to one another in, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your hearts to the Lord. Notice what he says. Now, in the time of, uh, in the first century, they could have cut the water uh, with wine to make it a little bit more palatable. A lot of scholars, classic scholars believe that. There's really no archaeological evidence to say that's the reason why they drink wine. Look at, they drink wine. Get over it. They drank wine. But what Paul is talking about is that don't get drunk. Don't get drunk. Because drunking numbs your senses. Actually, you go to Proverbs, uh, drinking in excess actually causes your mind to utter perverse thoughts. And King Lemuel, his mom says, look at Lemuel, it's not good for kings to be given over to much wine and intoxication because you're going to compromise your standards. And when we overconsume alcohol, debauchery, reckless living, you don't care about the consequences. That's what debauchery means. You don't care about the consequences. You're living in the moment. And you're living good and feeling that Paul says, no, 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 that's not for the life of a Christian. That's not what should be done. As a matter of fact, you should be drunk with the Holy Spirit. Not in the sense of being foolish and stumbling around, but let the Holy Spirit fill your heart. Because when the Holy Spirit fills your heart, you're going to speak not perversity, not manipulation, not abuse. You're going to speak words of encouragement because it flows from something that's being radically transformed. Isn't this what Jesus taught us when he was talking with the Pharisees? He's arguing with them. Matthew 12, 34, for the mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. So when we're angry and we're spitting out all this wrath and anger and all this, whatever it is, what's in your heart? Because that's what's going on there. Jesus says it's not what goes into a man that defiles a person. It's what comes out. And that's what comes out comes from your heart. Paul's like, church, look it. Don't numb your senses. That's cheating. That's a coward's way out. I come home, I'm stressed out. All I want to do is just get drunk. No. Paul says that's not what we should be doing. Be alert. Because if you want to numb things out, that means the enemy's actively moving in your life, in your family. But instead, be filled with the Spirit so that you can discern, we can be alert to what is going on, always giving thanks. Always giving thanks for all the things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, to God our Father. Psalm 104 talks about entering his courts with thanksgiving and praise. We have an attitude of gratitude. How do you always give thanks? How do you have this ability to speak to one another with words of encouragement, psalms and hymns and scripture, all these things? It's because you're allowing Christ to radically, continually transform your life. Because where we are at today, I pray that we are closer to Jesus than what we were six months ago. That's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that my heart uh, is better changed today, closer to Jesus than what it was six months ago. That's always my goal. I hope that's your goal. 
I can't really monitor it like tomorrow because sometimes I have my ups, sometimes I have my downs, and I'm all over the place depending upon what's going on in my life. But if I measure in six-month increments, are you closer to Jesus today than when you were six months ago? If not, why not? And if you are, celebrate that. That's awesome because it's a milestone because that means you're, you're kicking the enemy out less in your life, less access, and you're allowing the Holy Spirit to have more access to your life. And I wish, as I told the first service, like, I wish this downloaded like a software update like your phone. When we read it and we get convicted and we're just like, man, that really, yeah. Why don't I do this? You go to bed, you got Jesus 3.0 when you wake up in the morning and you wake up and you're like, yeah, I'm cruising. I got all that stuff taken care of. I wish it was like that. It's not. It is a war between you and the enemy for you to take that step. Am I going to honor Christ with this decision or am I going to dishonor him? Am I going to let the world intoxicate me or am I going to let the Holy Spirit fill me? It's there. It's a battleground. And here's the reality. The battle never stops until Jesus calls you home. You are old. We know the war is won. We know how Revelation ends. We know where we're going. But the battles are still taking place in our homes, in our marriages, in our relationships, in our friendships, everything. Every day we wake up, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Fill me with your spirit because I want to honor you. I want to have this attitude of gratitude. And in Ephesians, he continues, and subject yourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. There's that word, subject. It's to willingly place yourself under somebody's authority. Subject yourself is to willingly place yourself under somebody's authority. So who's he talking to right here? The church. Subject yourselves to one another in the fear of the Lord. Because we want to do everything that honors the Lord. Notice that this command comes after you being aware of a heart of thanksgiving and an attitude of gratitude. It's not before. Learn to love. Uh, love. Learn to encourage one another. Learn to speak positive words of encouragement. Be thankful in all things. And by the way, church, submit to one another. Willingly place yourself. Now, God can move in your life, and he can force you to do whatever he wants to, him, whatever he wants done, but that's, you're going to just behavior modify is what will happen. It's not coming from the heart. Nobody likes behavior modification because it only lasts for like a week. And then we start getting to our old patterns again because you just behavior modified for the moment. Paul's talking about, no, willingly place yourself under, uh, to one another in the fear of the Lord. Gal uh, Galatians 5. If you turn to Galatians 5, uh, I want to read verse uh, 13. Notice what Paul says here in Galatians 5.13. He says, For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, and do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another through love. Serve one another. Submit to one another in love. And if we're growing in Christ, this naturally begins to take place. All that scripture to get to verse 22. Wives, subject yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, most of the time we jump right into 22. By the way, in uh, Ephesians 5, about one and a half to two verses, Paul is talking to the wife. Nine verses, he spends time talking to the husbands. So if that's an indicator of who needs to pay attention, we need to pay attention. Wives, willingly place yourself under the authority of your husband as to the Lord. It's the same verb that links it right back to uh, the verse that we just read. Church, submit to one another. Wives, as also to your husbands, as to the Lord. Again, we're not talking a transaction. Paul is not telling wives, submit yourself to a domineering husband that's going to manipulate you. And husbands, be aware of this. This is not a verse for you to manipulate, leverage, abuse, all that. Woman, submit to me because I'm the head of the house. That's an arrogant posture. That's an arrogant posture that is not honoring the God. Show me your faith by, let me see how you treat your wife. Let's actually start there. Because it was one of the great circular, uh, circuit preachers says, I don't want to hear anything about your Christianity unless I see you, how you treat your wife. Because sometimes men can behavior modify out in public or here at church, and then behind closed doors, they beat their wives, emotionally beat them down, manipulate, manipulate them, whatever. So this is not the verse that Paul is talking about. This is not the verse where we say submit because this is what the Bible says. 
Because the responsibility, husbands, which we'll get to next week, we are to present our wives as Christ presents the church. Sacrificial, loving, washing her, encouraging her, where he presents her in all her glory better than when he found her. That's the charge of the husband. But are we fulfilling that? We'll find out next week. Wives, look at when we forget about the person that God has entrusted to us, husbands, when we have a wife, we forget about who God created. And we're not to manipulate them. We're not to abuse them. We're not to uh, become so transactional in our demands of them that we forget about the relational. Paul is reminding, look, at there's an order within the household that God created, and I'll show you this here in a little bit. But we're not to leverage this. As they subject themselves to their husbands, uh, as the church does, and we just read in verse 21, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church. The husband gives an account to God for the wife and the family that has been entrusted to him. That's our responsibility. We got nine verses in Ephesians to talk about this. It's its own sermon. But we have to give an accounting to Jesus and if the husband is given accountability to Christ because uh, we're the head of the wife, we are the head of the family, this is not in a chauvinistic and a misogynistic way. That's not what Paul's talking about. We try to understand one another. We try to love one another. Later on, Paul will say, wives, respect your husbands um, with that. And all this comes from the order of what God has for us. It's when we are in a relational balance with Christ and we're centered with Christ-centered love the church will submit to one another in the fear of the Lord because we're giving Christ. That same submission comes to the wife, to the husband, husbands to Christ, and everything begins to roll as God has it planned. If we are not following the biblical principle, I'll tell you what, culture is going to come in and replace it. We don't need to have God, spouse, children. I love Christ more than I love my wife and more than I love my kids. My relationship with him comes first, period, end of story. Then I will love my wife and then I will love my kids. When we get this order mixed up, there's no shalom in your home. You're going to be warring at each other, arguing with each other because it's out of the creative balance that God created in Genesis. But notice with this order and the template giving is that it all models the Genesis account, which I'll show you, but it also models the Christ to the church, from the church into the relationships. It all has a particular model. It's not that this is old-fashioned, like we need to get this out of here. No, this is Scripture. This is how God created the homes to be. Marriages between man and woman, marriages within a particular order, not abusing and manipulating one another. And I'm not naive to think that there are not wives that do not abuse or manipulate their husbands. There are wives that do that. So it's on both ends. But if we take a look at Scripture, it says, no, compliment one another. Serve one another in love selflessly for the best of that person, because in return, he will then serve you selflessly, love you. He's presenting you, you're presenting him, and it becomes a complementary fashion. That's the goal. That's what marriage is about. It's never to the point to where I just want to consume you for something, and when I'm done consuming you, I want nothing to do with you. If you're single, pay attention. Are you dating a person that just wants to consume you? And if you're having sex premaritally, think about this. When you stop having sex, is that person gone? You're no longer putting out? Therefore, I'm out of here. I'm only in here because of what I can get from you. And if you're no longer giving it to me, I'm leaving. That's why God says, look it, be chaste. Don't give in to this because this is going to lead to a, 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 a plethora of heartaches but come together in marriage and give something special because then you're going to know, well, they're in it for me. They love me, not for my money, not for my body, not for whatever it is. There's a certain order that God places, and if we fall out of line with that, man, it just wreaks havoc. And then we bear the scars spiritually. We wish that we could take things back, but we can't. Verse 24, but as the church is subject... Uh, to Christ. Also, the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Paul emphasizes before he jumps into the husband spiel, husband spiel, they look at the church is also subject. 
It's the same thing. We follow the example. All of this is because we are centered in Christ-like love. If I'm growing with Jesus, I don't want to manipulate my spouse. I don't want to manipulate my wife. I don't want to force her to do something that she doesn't want to do. I'm not going to twist. I'm not going to leverage it over here. I want to grow in the understanding that like, how can I present you blameless, spotless? Because Jesus is we're building his bride, the church, up to present blameless and spotless. How do I grow in that? Well, surround yourself with Christian couples that are growing in that direction. If you're dating, if you're courting, if you're engaged or whatever it is, surround yourself with a couple that is moving in the direction you want to move because they could pour into you. Not that we're perfect, we're not. But we're trying to move closer and closer to Jesus. Again, Paul is not talking about manipulation or misogyny or chauvinism because if the model is Jesus in the church, Tell me where in that model is Jesus chauvinistic, misogynistic, doesn't care about the wife, doesn't care about his bride. Where in that model does Jesus ever abuse, manipulate, and pervert his relationship with the church? It's never there. We, as humans, manipulate and pervert and abuse people. The Bible says that is not biblical. We need to raise up and we need to walk and grow together with that. So here's the order of the family. You can take a picture of it or you can go on our QR code thing and you can download the sermon notes as you see them. God is creator of all things. There, there it is. God creates man, Adam, from Adama. He creates man from earth. And out of Adam, he takes woman. He takes Eve. He creates Eve. God, man, woman. And then Genesis chapter 4, you got the kids. Seth, Cain, and Abel. Um, and all of that line. We have Christ as the head of the church. The husband answers to Christ. The wife answers to her husband. And then the kids fall in line as well. What Paul represents and presents to us in Ephesians 5 goes right back to Genesis 1 through 4. That is the natural created order of the house. And when we step out of bounds with that, because we allow culture to tell us how to run our home, we fall into an area of just turmoil and tension. Um, but that's not the way that God created it. And so we want to be able to grow and present. Uh, okay, so how do we do this? So enough narrative from me. I want to give you several things that we can all practice. Hopefully, we can all practice before we move into a time of communion. Number one, fill your heart with words that draw you close to Christ. Fill your heart with words that draw you close to Christ. Since we live in a very media-driven age, fill your eyes with images that would draw you close to Christ. Man, the heart is the battleground that the enemy wants to take over. Jesus says, whatever we speak over people in our marriages, whatever it is, because there's something in the heart. What's in our heart? Uh, fill your heart with words that draw you close to Christ. Number two, turn moments of frustration into moments of prayer. Look, there's many times you love your wife or you love your spouse, but there's many times you're only going to like them because you don't really feel like loving them, or you're going to love them and you're not really going to like them. Um, we get frustrated. But if you're not married and if you're single, there's moments when you encounter relationships with other people. You're like, I really just want to give you wall-to-wall -wall counseling right now. And I really, 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 really don't want to be around you. So here's what's going to happen. You get the fork in the road. The enemy says, so let's go ahead and talk about that. Well, this is the reason why, because they're always talking down on me because they never listen. We talk about the same thing over and over again. The home is never cleaned or whatever. They're always coming in late. All this stuff, they're not listening. They're rebelling. And we just keep talking about it. And we brood over it. And we create an argument in our head where we're usually the winner. Because if that person says this, I'm going to come back and say this. And if they tell me this, oh, man, I got them by the throat on that one. And we start entertaining a dialogue. Or we back up. I'm still frustrated. Well, this is the reason why. Let me pause. Lord, open up their eyes, open up their heart. Take that frustrating moment and put it into prayer. Lord, I'm lifting up this person. I'm lifting up my hard-headed spouse. I'm lifting up my kids. I'm lifting up my friends. I'm lifting up my in-laws. Lord, I really want to brood about this and argue it because I just want to get it up. But I want to make it into a prayer. Lord, open, change our hearts. Help us to see what's going on. So notice that. 
One direction, I can gossip about it. I can talk to my friends about that, which is betraying the trust of your spouse as we begin to talk to other people about it. And I can brood over it and get angry and more angry, or I could say, Lord, I'm so frustrated, but I'm going to pray about it. What direction are you going to choose? Because it is so juicy and tempting to go down this path. But we got to be disciplined to say, I want to, but Lord, help me to respond properly when I'm frustrated. What's the next step? What's your will in my life? What's, what's the next step for this? And lastly here, learn to trust God's order of the family. Some of us might walk away here like, I really don't agree with that. I still think it's an antiquated system and whatever, however it is. Well, I'm just relating to you what is written in Scripture. But can we learn to trust God's order of family? Because he designed it a certain way. And as a family, if we do not practice how God designed it, we're not talking doormat. We're not talking the wife becomes a doormat. We're not talking abusing. That's none of what the Bible says. If we don't practice the order of God's family, we're going to be dislocated in our relationship with him. Something's going to be off. And we're going to come right back to, usually, the family. Because it starts with a personal relationship with God, then it goes into our, our marriages, and it goes into everything else that we do. And I don't know about you, but I want to model things that point people to Jesus. That's, that, that's my goal. Not only in public, that's really easy to behavior modify. I want to honor and point people to Jesus even in my private life. When I think nobody's looking, like, Lord, I need to clean up some area here too. Good. Now we're aware of it. Are we going to be wise and start applying it? What we learn? Or are we going to continue to be foolish and say, you know what? That was really convicting. Eh, but anyways, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. It's going to be harder and harder to hear the voice of God and feel his spirit when we just keep hardening our hearts toward what he's having us do.